It's the Broadway.com Fall Preview 2018, brought to you by Masterpass. Please welcome our host, Laura Benanti. Hi, I'm Laura Benanti. You may know me from my Tony winning performance in the Tony winning revival of Gypsy opposite Tony winner Patti Lapone. My hilarious impressions of the First Lady or my delightfully personal and enriching presence on social media, aka oversharing. I am here to match the walls and also to talk about the fall theater season, which I am joining as the star of My Fire Lady. Still, I'm not in rehearsal. It's gonna be great. The fall on Broadway is shaping up to be full of larger than life shows about such topics as a legendary monster the goddess of pop, and a drag queen, and his mom. And if monsters, divas, and drag don't turn you on, there are plenty of exciting plays about everything from the greatest stage actress in the world, God, didn't know somebody wrote a play about me, to the British game snooker, still, I promise I'll get it, to fact checking. Facts, we miss you. So join me now as Broadway.com celebrates the fall season with a look at the stars and new shows hitting the boards just means like getting on the stage, being on the stage, right? Hi, I'm Laura Benanti and I'm in a chair. Sometimes I'll be sitting and sometimes I'll be standing and I don't want you to let that throw you. After seven seasons playing fixer Olivia Pope on Scandal, Carrie Washington has set aside her character's 25 ounce wine glass. She's returning to Broadway in the searing new drama, American Son. Joining her is Jeremy Jordan, who is back on the boards after doing something only the best and brightest Broadway performers get to do, star on TV's Supergirl. I have been gone from the theater for quite some time doing mostly television and um, I just left Supergirl and came back to New York. Literally a few weeks after I got back, I got a phone call about this show. When I read it, I just uh, sort of fell in love with it instantly. Jordan plays Officer Paul Larkin, a young recruit faced with a late night visit at a Florida police station by an interracial couple trying to find out information on their son. Scandal star Kerry Washington and Broadway favorite Stephen Pasquale play the worried parents and Eugene Lee rounds out director Kenny Leon's cast as a police lieutenant. I don't feel like it really takes sides. Each character sort of has a very different viewpoint of what's happening in the show. And uh, I think each character is really heard. And, and I think that audience members can sort of relate to one or multiples of them and then sort of draw their own conclusions about, you know, who is right, who is wrong. Jordan believes that in the explosive political climate of our day, Demos Brown's timely discussion on race, power and family is just what audiences need. When you're in an audience of a play, you have to sit there and hear everyone out. And I think the play sort of touches on the fact that we don't really communicate very well, especially when it comes to race and when it comes to children and when it comes to police versus non-police. I, I think that so many people ha are so set in whatever their belief is, and I, that's like that in politics and, and anything in the world these days. The play sort of forces you to listen to, to everyone's viewpoint and then draw your own conclusion. She's a chart topper, a TV star, an Oscar winner, a rock goddess, a survivor, a legend. Obviously, I'm talking about Cher. The always dressed to kill superstar is also the subject of a new Broadway musical. There is only one Cher, but when it comes to the Cher show, there are three performers playing her, including Tony nominated powerhouse Stephanie J. Block. Get ready for a musical look at the evolution of an icon. I never knew I wanted to be a pop goddess until I was a pop goddess, and now there's kind of no going back. Stepping into her shoes is really kind of amazing and freeing, and I have embraced a lot of who I am by being Cher. 
Block is a well-respected Broadway star who has led musicals including Wicked, 9 to 5, and Anything Goes, and received Tony Award nominations for turns in The Mystery of Edwin Drood and Falsettos. But stepping out in Bob Mackie gowns while singing the hits of Cher has presented new challenges. Having to walk out in front of 2,200 people saying, look at all the girls and the goods and still feel confident enough to not get preoccupied by that. Still being there as a character, servicing the show, servicing the play, and not be worried about, is my nipple showing? How does my butt look? How do my abs look? So I had to release that and just work hard off stage so that I didn't have to think about it on stage. After initially turning down the chance to play Cher, Block changed her mind after a lunch meeting with Cher show director Jason Moore, the Tony-nominated talent behind Avenue Q and Shrek the Musical. He presented a really beautiful and kind of non-linear way of telling the story that's going to give the audience a different frame of mind instead of just sitting down and expecting to see a share concert or a share impersonator and that was freeing for me and that was what allowed me to say yes and move forward. With jukebox and bio musicals all the rage on Broadway, Block stresses that shows like The Share Show can still hold the power of more classic musical fare. You can't go in with your nose like this saying, oh, well, is it Sondheim? No. Can it move you in the same emotional place? Yeah, not in the same way, but it can take you to the same place if you allow yourself to go on the journey. And boy, am I allowing myself to go on this journey. <laughs> You're watching the Broadway.com Fall Preview, brought to you by Masterpass. Buy tickets to all the hottest new shows this fall with Masterpass on Broadway.com. Wondering what the lifespan of a fact is in a world of alternative facts and fake news is enough to send you to bed with a cold compress over your eyes. But wake up, because this new play stars Daniel Radcliffe, Cherry Jones, and Bobby Cannavale. It's about an editor, an author, and a determined young fact checker. And I'm sure it's gonna spark think pieces and dinner conversations and dorm room conversations about truth versus fiction and so forth. But most importantly, it stars Daniel Radcliffe and Cherry Jones and Bobby Cannavale. Daniel Radcliffe, Cherry Jones, Bobby Cannavale. The three stars of the show share Laura's enthusiasm about appearing on stage together. Are you kidding me? Look at this. <laughs> Just look at this. I was changing my shirt yesterday, and and um, and Cherry came in and she went, "I missed it. Can you do it again?" So yeah, we all love each other. Even I, the postmenopausal lesbian. <laughs> and I went, "You're a lesbian?" I got a couple of. Um, emails from uh, these guys just before we started cherry email us both and, and I was just like oh these guys are delightful like this is gonna be a really fun play the lifespan of a fact is based on the 2012 book of the same name by John Degata and Jim Fingal a creative work that documents their collaboration as author and fact checker on Degata's essay about a Las Vegas suicide Cannavale plays Degata Radcliffe plays Fingal and Jones plays their editor I play uh, Jim Fingal, who's a fact checker who is assigned to fact check this piece by an author who is not necessarily used to, uh, he's writing for a, sort of a magazine with journalistic standards and he's not really used to meeting those or having to meet those. Um, and so I get sent in to make his life hell. They're based on real people, uh, John Degada, Jim Fingal who through many years of, of putting this story together, the story about the story, have created a sort of work that really does blur the line between fact and fiction, and fiction and non-fiction, truth and non-truths, half-truths, um, in a really delightful way that I think asks a lot of questions um, and doesn't really answer any of them. Although the three characters in the lifespan of a fact have different approaches, they all strive for the same goal, to get Degada's story out in the world. All three characters want the same thing, just versions of, of the same thing. You want it to be accurate, you want it to be profound and emotionally true, and I just want to be able to publish it because it's brilliant writing. So we've all got something at stake. In the Waverly Gallery, Oscar winner Kenneth Lonergan's memory play, the elderly matriarch of a New York City family is causing concern for her daughter, son-in-law, and grandson. 
with a star-packed cast that includes comic genius Elaine Mother F and May and directed by rising talent Lila Neugebauer, the Waverly Gallery will have you laughing and crying. And I know that that's a good thing that people say all the time, but you're going to laugh and cry. In bringing his play to Broadway, Lonergan is excited to work with Lila Neugebauer, who won an Obie Award for directing Sarah Delap's The Wolves in 2017. Well, Lila's just a great director, and they're hard to find. She tackles difficult plays and does them beautifully, so anybody would want to work with a director like that. Of course, Lonergan is not only an acclaimed writer, but also an Oscar-nominated film director, which makes him a unique collaborator for Neugebauer. It is a tremendous gift to get to collaborate with someone whose work you've admired for a long time. In terms of what interests me and draws me into Kenny's work, I think in part has to do with the uh, meticulous attention to detail at the level of characterization and human psychology and behavior and the, the worlds of the plays as they're articulated. Having an understanding of his directorial sensibility, I also recognize in his work both at the level of the writing and his work as a director that I feel tremendous kinship. In recent seasons, Broadway audiences have enjoyed new productions of Lonergan's off-Broadway successes This Is Our Youth, played in 2014, and last season saw Lobby Hero. The Waverly Gallery, which played for just 70 performances off-Broadway in 2000, featured an award-winning performance by stage great Eileen Hecker in a role inspired by his grandmother. The play was inspired by a series of events that happened to my own grandmother and my own family back in the late 80s. It's a tremendously personal play. It's about uh, fundamentally decent, well-meaning, flawed people who are attempting to overcome insurmountable odds and trying to be decent and take care of each other. For Broadway, comedy icon Elaine May will take on the matriarch role, with Oscar nominees Lucas Hedges and Joan Allen, Tony nominee Michael Cera, and Tony-winning director David Cromer rounding out the company. Lonergan said he didn't alter the script for the play's Broadway bow. I didn't change anything. There's two lines I thought I might change, but I, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out the first time. It's exciting to see it brought to life by another equally great cast, so I'm very curious and interested to see what they're going to do with it. Imagine being a gay Jewish drag queen and torch singer in 1979 New York City. Now picture having a stormy relationship with your bisexual lover, a longing for a husband and child, and getting a visit from your overbearing, intolerant mother. Welcome to the world of Torch Song, Harvey Firestein's 1983 Tony-winning play that's getting a new life with Michael Urie in the role played by Firestein in the original production. The show also features Ward Horton and Jack DeFalco. We're doing straight white men, right? Yeah, I think it's <laughs> <laughs> That's the play we're doing? We're, so, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite, guys. In this trio of plays, this trio of stars play men who come together as a family for Yuri's Arnold. Arnold is a guy looking for a little bit of love and really a place to call home and people to call family in a time where people like him couldn't easily obtain things like that. Ed is a, a guy who's like Arnold, looking for love and looking for a family, and he's the on-again, off-again relationship with really the love of his life, Arnold. But as a, uh, as a gay man back in the 70s, it's really hard for him to come to grips with, with that. Newcomer DeFalco plays street smart David, a city kid with a difficult past. He's unapologetic about being himself a, a gay kid in a world where it just doesn't fit in. He's lucked out enough to find a family with the lovely Ma. Well, I guess not Ma, but you're my Ma. Uh, <laughs> Arnold Beckoff. Relationships are at the core of this play, which solidified scribe Harvey Firestein as a pioneer for LGBTQ storytelling. His Torch Song trilogy, which premiered off-Broadway in 1982, was the first of its kind to explore the desire and the choice gay men have to form families of their own. Working with Harvey has been not only delightful, because he is a truly menschy guy, but also I've felt inspired by what he has done, not only as, as, as a creator, as a writer and an actor, but as an advocate. He really did foresee something that was an impossibility at the time. He foresaw gay adoption, which is just something that was never, never thought about. That was like science fiction to people. Yeah. When audiences looked at it in the early 80s, the idea that a gay man could adopt a son and raise that son with another man was ludicrous. And one of the things that I love about Harvey Firestein, though, is how he approached this whole topic was with humor. And he brought people together in a theater, and now everyone's laughing together and, and enjoying this 
this family that's on stage that they've never seen before and they're learning from it. Right. By the end, they're in love. Yeah. They're in love with this family. It's hard not to fall in love. Yeah. yeah. In the new musical, The Prom, an Indiana girl and her girlfriend are thrust into an unwelcome spotlight when the town's parents decide to keep things on the straight and narrow. So who will come to the rescue? Broadway stars, of course! These brassy, sassy Broadway favorites, Beth Level and Brooks Ashmanskis, that's not a real name, are here to save the day with the power of show tunes. I find that when I'm around non-theater people, they look at me like, are you always like that? Yeah, stop it's screaming. Like, yes, I am always. Are you always on? It's like, oh, I don't, I'm not on. This is just who, just yeah. me. But, I'm uh, this but loud. now that I'm so aware of it, I shall <laughs> tone it down, and right. I can't. In the prom, these Broadway favorites play Dee Dee Allen and Barry Gleckman, two alter ego stage stars who find themselves as fish out of water in middle America. It's based on a true story mm -hmm. of a girl. I believe it was Mississippi, and yes, we changed so. now to Indiana, who mm -hmm. wanted to take her girlfriend to the prom, the lesbian couple. Mm -hmm. And the PTA or some group found out about it and canceled the prom. The whole thing. So they were very popular. We learn about this situation in Indiana, mm -hmm. and we decide that we're going to go out there and save this school, this community, and especially this girl. Right. We're going to change her lives. And, and of course, we make everything worse. Joining Dee Dee and Barry on their well-intentioned crusade are Juilliard grad turned cater waiter Trent Oliver, played by two-time Tony nominee Christopher Siever, and Broadway hoofer Angie Schwar, playing a Broadway hoofer named, well, Angie. Clearly, the characters in the prom are recognizable for its stars. The characters right. that we play are delicious. <laughs> yes, they are. It is very close to home, actually because we're actually playing people who are very similar to who we are. And then you, you get to a point in the show where it's, it's sort of heartbreaking for the mm. character, but it's also heartbreaking for you because it's actually who you are underneath it all. And it's fun to do that. It's fun to actually have a character that's so entertaining and yet has, they have this great arc and right. this like a revelation of discovery of humanity. Right. We don't get to do that no. very much. We usually just get to be funny, funny, funny. Just one thing straight through. And, and this, this is, is layered lots and lovely. Layered and lots of colors. It's really, it's a privilege. And funny. And really funny. Hopefully. The fall theater season has officially begun. Get tickets to a slew of new musicals and plays and enjoy faster checkout with MasterPass. You know what's risky? Calling a Broadway play the nap. Might as well call it phone ringing in the middle of you singing, right? But Richard Bean, the playwright of the hilarious One Man, Two Governors, is just the kind of award-winning British playwright who doesn't care if you smirk at the title, which is actually about the surface of the table, obviously. He's written a comedy thriller all about snooker, which is like a British version of pool. Ben Schnetzer is making his Broadway debut in the play, and this is his picture on an iPad. Hello. The Nap is a dark comedy about family and about morals and about match fixing in professional sport, but it's subversive, it's funny, it's very, very zany. Schnetzer plays Dylan Spokes, a rising snooker star who is pulled into a con by a threatening gangster. He comes from a very chaotic uh, criminal home life. He gets put in very compromising situations where the stakes are extraordinarily high, having a bit of a prodigious talent for this particular game is an opportunity for him to make money, have a career, have a, a quality of life that otherwise might be denied him. Playwright Richard Bean previously made Broadway audiences laugh with the 2012 hit One Man, Two Governors, which helped launch the career of James Corden. For The Nap, Bean is exposing American audiences to a very British billiard game. A snooker table is, I believe it's six by 12, whereas a pool table is eight by four. The, it's a totally different scoring game, totally different number of balls on the table. The history of it is, uh, which we touch on 
significantly in the play, is very, very rich. It's a much more popular game in, in the United Kingdom than it is here. It's been fun finding places to practice when <laughs> there are none. <laughs> Schnetzer first heard of snooker when he was studying theater abroad in London, but the New Yorker, now best known for notable roles in films like The Book Thief and Pride, didn't experience the world of snooker until after landing the lead in the nap. I didn't know much about it, but I ended up getting cast in it while the World Snooker Championships were going on while I was visiting London. And so I went to Sheffield and saw Ronnie O'Sullivan play, which was amazing. The air is, is, is really charged. It's, it's quite an experience going to see it, and hopefully we'll get a, get a taste of that once we do it on stage. The Nap is not only Schnetzer's first role on Broadway, it will also mark his first time as a professional athlete of sorts, as the play requires him to actually play snooker in front of the live audience. It's a really hard game, but I'm really starting to enjoy it now, and I've been playing as much as I can, and um, I don't know if I can afford to join the New York Athletic Club, though. <laughs> but, um, as long as I have access to a table, I definitely, um, definitely want to keep playing. Sarah Bernhardt was the first celebrity stage performer. She was so famous, like Beyonce famous. With her outrageous notoriety, the divine Sarah made some crazy choices, and one of the biggest was taking on the title role in Hamlet. Just trust me, the reaction to the announcement was the 1899 equivalent of breaking the internet. Playwright Teresa Rebeck delves into the brouhaha in her new work, Bernhardt Hamlet which stars another great lady of the stage, Tony winner Janet McTeer. You know, you do this for the love of the beast, you really do. I'm playing Sarah Bernhardt, so frankly, if I'm crap, the play will fall apart. So that's quite a lot of pressure. <laughs> stage and screen great McTeer is no stranger to Sarah Bernhardt's famous undertaking. In fact, she got familiar with the historical happening way before encountering Rebeck's script. As it happened, somebody sent me the book of uh, Sarah Bernhardt's um, Hamlet, I want to say 20 years ago when I read it, thinking, wow, that's interesting. How amazing. A woman of 55, as she was then, decides to play Hamlet. How radical. Go, girl. The play was sent to me um, end of last year. I loved the characters. I loved her. Teresa's so clever. She's so witty. She's so funny. But she's also very clever and very complicated. It's a play with a lot of comedy. It deals with theatre itself and what is theatre and why do we love it. In 1899, Bernhardt's decision to take on the epic male role of Hamlet was an unconventional one, to say the least. She came from a time when people were really stuck in their ideas. If you're playing Hamlet, this is what you do. You come on stage left and you hold the skull then and blah, blah, blah. And I think what's so great is that she threw those ideas up and said theatre should be alive, it should be new, it should be living. But essentially it's sort of homage. Homage to a woman who stood up and did it at a time when women didn't stand up and do it. She did. And that's pretty incredible. So McTeer seems to have Bernhardt's take on Hamlet down. Would the stage and screen star ever consider tackling the role herself? Who knows, maybe I'll do it. Sarah did, why shouldn't I? What's 2,000 pounds, 20 feet tall, and about to take over Broadway? It's King Kong! The musical version of the epic story, let's call it the newest wonder of the world, follows a young actress played by Christiane Pitts, a dashing filmmaker and a voyage from 1930s New York to an uncharted island in search of something big. And the gorilla sings. No, it doesn't. Less interested. So my first uh, introduction to King Kong was the 2005 film directed by Peter Jackson, starring Naomi Watts, who I love. And I was obsessed with her beauty, her strength. I then watched the original, 1931 it came out, uh, with Faye Ray, who's stunning. It's just a classic American tale. And here we are, 2018, and it's still gonna affect people, I think, in a strong way. Everyone knows the iconic image of eighth wonder of the world, King Kong, climbing the Empire State Building, clutching a terrified Anne Darrow in his fist. With a script by Jack Thorne, the Tony Award-winning playwright of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, the Broadway King Kong looks to provide a compelling backstory to the classic damsel in distress character. Jack Thorne has written a script that explores every bit of her life, and unlike other versions, she actually saves herself. She doesn't wait for anybody to come rescue her. She rolls up her sleeves and figures out how to do it on her own. 
Pitts is the first actress of color to play classic American beauty and Darrow on a big scale. They casted me in a very color conscious way. As a woman of color in 1930s, my circumstances were vastly different. And it's exciting to bring that to this character, to know that in order to make it to New York City from this farm and start her big new life, as a black woman in 1930, I had to go through a hell of a lot to get there. I'm just honored that they are not asking me to hide things that make my Anne Darrow unique and strong. After premiering in Australia in 2013, producers have revamped the show's creative team for Broadway, including the addition of Olivier Award winner Drew McOney as the new director choreographer and up-and-coming composer Eddie Perfect providing the musical songs. Pitts says the production is sure to wow audiences. It's the biggest thing I've ever been a part of. Um, when I do scenes with Kong and he's literally standing over me, I just sit on the brakes and I stand looking at his 2,000 pound body. And I'm like, this is so much bigger than me. It's so humbling and exciting. Well, I, I thought we were done, it's fine. This is the rise of the rule. I'm gonna work on it. Signing off. If you wanna see me on Broadway this fall, had the Lincoln Center Theater production of My Fair Lady. It would be lovely to see you there. I didn't write that.